The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks, you early birds. We're going to get going here in about six minutes. I've got 1054 here local time in the beautiful city of Cleveland. Make yourselves comfortable. Uh, if you don't mind chatting your locations into the Q&A panel, um, give you some shout outs as we go along here. Uh, again, we're going to get going in about six minutes or so. Hey gang, welcome. Um, we're going to go in here in about three minutes. Thanks for logging in early. For those of you who have uh, messaged over your locations, the cities you're dialing in from, thanks for doing that. For those of you who are new and just logged in, if you don't mind letting us know where you're logging in from, that'd be great. Um, I'll be right back in about uh, a minute or so and uh, we'll start getting this thing going.
All right. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Depending on where you are in the world, that'll sound just about right. This is Don Cook. Um, thanks for joining us today. We've got a great webinar scheduled for you all. Um, for those of you who haven't messaged me, uh, let me know where you're dialing in from. I'd love to, to see where everyone is. Uh, I was lucky enough to go meet the WLPC folks last week, and I have to apologize for leaving you with an amateur. Apparently, there were some audio and <laughs> screen sharing difficulties last week, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, even though it wasn't my fault, I blame Dave and Josh <laughs> for that last week. Uh, so we'll do a better job this week. Um, uh, so let's see. Let me see where everyone's logging in from today. We've got uh, Vancouver, San Diego, Houston, Cincinnati. Uh, I'm up here in Cleveland, of course, with Dave here in the office. We've got Philadelphia, New York, Fort Lauderdale. Excellent. Uh, London. Great. Thanks, gang. Keep these coming. Love hearing where everybody is. Iceland. Oh, you, you take the prize so far. You've got the... The, the longest distance. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, um, Frederick, Maryland. Excellent. Welcome. <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and get started again. Uh, I apologize for last week. We had some technical difficulties. I was out at w WLPC, the Wireless Land Professionals Conference with uh, Jim Vada and Russ. Um, had our little user group out there. Uh, they, of course, were there for the entire conference. Great event. I'm glad I was able to come out there and do that, but uh, I left Dave in here, Dave here, and uh, Josh Lane, and they let me down. Well, just just to let you know that the um, since Josh is not actually in the office right now, yeah, I, we can I talk about it. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about it. So, for those of you who joined last week, thanks for coming back. Uh, we'll get it right this time, I promise. So um, we've got a great webinar topic, which was last week's webinar topic, uh, Wi-Fi Security 101. And we've got uh, Mr. Dave Hallis with us again. He's our resident uh, CWNA, and he's a solutions engineer. Dave, um, for those of you who are, are, are not familiar with you, for those of them, those of us who are not familiar with you, uh, if you could give us a little bit of background, uh, why should we should listen, that kind of stuff would be great. Sure. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, CWNA is certified. Uh, and uh, over 25 years of experience in the wireless industry. Here I'm, uh, so I was involved with the development of um, wireless and then also here I'm a solutions engineer. Uh, well, obviously as this next line kind of indicates, I used to work at Cisco. Uh, if you're familiar with the Aeronet product line, I, was, I came in through that acquisition. Uh, and then I was also recognized as a Cisco innovator while I was at Cisco. I was involved in standards, as kind of mentioning, and so uh, one of the ones that's rather pertinent here was that I chaired the 82.11i task group, which is for enhanced security, and so we'll touch on that obviously a little bit. I also uh, was the initial task group chair for 82.11ah, which was for sub-1 gigahertz. That's part of the Internet of Things. Uh, and then I was also involved in the formation of the Wi-Fi Alliance. It was known as WECA back then. And then I've got a number of pants in my name as well. All right. We're lucky to have you, Dave. Thank you. Um, some quick updates before we get going today. I mentioned um, that uh, I was able to go to WLPC. So on behalf of Jim and Russ, who are there as well, thanks for, for meeting us for our user group, for those of you who are there. Um, Wireless LAN uh, Pros puts on a great conference every year. If you guys have not had a chance to go, this year's was in Arizona. Um, Really, really great event, a great turnout. Uh, thanks for coming. We launched our mobile eye for mini PC there. Um, so the, for those of you who are not familiar, um, mobile eye is now available on mini PCs. And that's relevant for those of you who are using robotics and warehouses, um, non-traditional um, IoT without operating systems, or if you're using Linux, uh, simply install mobile eye on a mini PC. We've got uh, minimum requirements now. Um, so uh, simply plug that in, plug it into a USB power or AC, and you're off and running with Mobileye. So pretty cool stuff there. Uh, we're heading to Hims in March. Uh, for those of you who are coming to uh, Orlando, hit me up and love to, to give you a tour of the products or introduce you to partners, uh, whatever that case may be. And then we'll be announcing um, our new ISV partnerships with Spectralink, Zebra, and Honeywell, which is a very big deal. So our mobile eye product will be available in their app stores shortly, um, but our 
product is already certified to plug and play uh, with their devices running Android. So we're really proud of that. We're going to make a, a, a lot of great uh, new friends uh, with those partnerships uh, as we get those rolling. So uh, we'll get on with the main meat and potatoes here. A little bit about us, for those of you who are not aware, founded in 2007, over 200 customers and 30 partners around the world, 13 patents. Uh, we're monitoring about 5 million devices on a, on a daily basis, crunching a lot of numbers, over a billion, in fact, uh, analyzed daily. We're on a lot of networks and on a lot of devices, so those numbers continue to multiply for us, and we're really proud of them, leading the industry in those categories. Um, security and privacy is really paramount to us. Um, we're GDPR compliant, so we go above and beyond, uh, not only what the EU needs, but also here in the U.S. and other countries as well. Uh, and our product, our hardware product, is certified in over 40 countries around the world. So really proud of that as well. So in a nutshell, 7Signal is here to enable the wireless world. And what we're doing is we're finding and fixing wireless issues. Um, since 2007, we've created an outside-in framework that's completely AP and device agnostic, completely modular, replete with reporting alerts and analytics, as you would expect. And what we're doing is we're looking for the top seven Wi-Fi problems, congestion, coverage, co-channel and radio interference, network services, roaming, adapters and drivers, and wireless LAN configuration. Everything that has to do, every issue, every challenge that has to do with Wi-Fi bubbles up to one of those seven problems. And how we do it, we're running active and passive tests on your network and on your devices for packet loss, latency and jitter, throughput, MOS score, uh, looking at those adapters and drivers, uh, delivering a, a full spectrum analysis for packet capture, uh, on and on. Just really, really great products uh, that allow you to be proactive um, with your um, wireless network monitoring. Uh, and as a complement to your access points, we're certainly not competing with them. Um, so to understand outside in, you certainly need to understand that legacy approach, and that's you know vendor dependence, and they provide great information about their own hardware, uh, and some of them give them you application uh, visibility and that kind of stuff, but they're not giving you visibility into the end user experience. That's where we come in. That's where Seven Signals Wireless Ecosystem enters the the fray. Um, so we're giving you data uh, that you can't get from your device manufacturer, that you can't get from your access points manufacturer, um, giving you information to get to the root cause of Wi-Fi issues. Um, because our software goes back in time and saves data up to 90 days, there's no more, sorry, I can't replicate the problem. Um, you know, just turn off, restart your device, and the, maybe the problem will go away. Uh, with us, you can go back to that location, uh, that access point that was having issues, that device that was having issues at that point in time, uh, look at reports and trends and see what was going on and, and be able to fix that. Um, with us, you're able to establish whether the issue is wired, wireless, or device related in seconds. Um, so it, it alleviates a lot of the finger pointing we hear a lot, you know, is it the device, is it the Wi-Fi? Uh, you'll know definitively and be able to fix the issue. Uh, we're not here to help point fingers. We're here to, to get to that root cause of the issue so you can fix it and, and uh, your users can enjoy quality Wi-Fi. So we do that two ways. We've got our Mobileye module and Sapphire Eye. They're all part of the Seven Signal platform. Mobileye is the application that runs on the device itself or mini PC, as I mentioned earlier. Any Windows, Mac, uh, OS, or Android device, 100% software base. And it's looking for these five problems, adapters and driver combinations, roaming issues, which is prevalent on those devices, adjacent and co-channel interference, coverage, and congestion, where Sapphire Eye is our software software enabled hardware um, that is a perfect uh, perfect client that lives up in the access points with the uh, or excuse me lives up in the rafters with the access points or down on a desk or mounted on a wall um, that's giving you that full spectrum analysis and it's looking for network service issues wireless LAN configuration issues co-channel and radio frequency interference because it has that spectrum analyzer on there it's able to give you more visibility into the the spectrum than mobile I would uh, and of course uh, both products uh, handle coverage and congestion so um, with that said, Dave, let's uh, let's get into a little uh, Wi-Fi security, shall we? Sure, sounds great. What we're doing here is we're trying to give you a little bit of an idea of 
uh, types of security that you know, hopefully what you've got is some security, which looks at like the, the top left, which is like Fort Knox. And Dave, at, yeah, at, as I was pulling these slides together, uh, I, I don't appreciate you junking up my, my PowerPoint test. <laughs> well, I tried not to cover up the seven signal part there. All right. The uh, now the one that's on the uh, left, but the lower part is where you might have some kinks uh, in your security. Uh, and that's where uh, we, we're going to kind of get into a little bit. The agenda that we have here is talk about security threat actors and then kind of go through, well, what is this uh, type of security that's in 802.11? Where did they actually come in through the different amendments? And then how does that relate to WPA3? And there's other things that I kind of get involved as well, like for instance, VLANs and VPNs, and then you might have uh, some questions about uh, with wireless intrusion detection systems. So I'll talk some about that. So the first thing that's chunking up some of the cover slides <laughs> is the security threat actors, and we have Boris and the big bad wolf there. I always like the uh, cartoon names, Boris Badenoff. <laughs> so you, you know that's a bad character. Yeah, they were really creative with that stuff. Security threat actors, a lot of times you get, uh, I will get, a, somebody will ask me, uh, is it secure? And I always have a tough time uh, answering that type of question. Uh, and the reason why is because it's like, well, is it secure from, like, from whom? Who are you talking about? Because there's a bit, a bit of a difference there. If you're talking about a nation state actor, for instance, um, are you talking about the NSA? Or, or are we talking about my little brother? Obviously, there's going to be some differences there as to uh, the types of uh, technology that they're able to take into account. And there's some various ones in between. For instance, is it, what about criminals uh, that are trying to break into your home network and to find out some of your financials? Uh, what about hackers and script kitties? What can they do? Uh, by script kitties, if you're, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about there is, well, what if there's a type of attack, which might sound very technical, but is it something where you could create a tool, so therefore that that tool is then available to somebody that's in high school? And they don't really have to know, they might be a little geeky, but uh, they just need to know a little bit and they just know how to download this uh, software tool to then perform some types of attacks. And is it something like that that could be done? Uh, and then there's also things like inside actors. Uh, there's uh, malicious types of attacks, and then there's non-malicious types of attacks. Then, as I kind of mentioned, you might have your little brother or little sister that's bugging you about something, and you might want to put some little stumbling block that puts in their way. Uh, and uh, there's obviously some ways that could, that could be done. So from here, uh, as kind of mentioned last week, uh, this is a picture of uh, me and Josh that I was trying to go through and give some description to Josh as to some of the security that goes on in 811. And especially back in the original standard, which had web. Uh, and so when I was uh, working on uh, 8211i and being the test group chair, uh, what were the issues uh, with the original standard? The original issue, had to do with that there was no key distribution protocol. Uh, if you're familiar with way back uh, 1999 and 2000, uh, and there was WEP, well, what did you actually do? It's like the only way that you could actually run encrypted was to write on a chalkboard. Well, here's the WEP key if you want to get on. That could work for like at a home or a small uh, office, but that doesn't work for a large organization. You can't tell 20,000 people uh, like a key and then expect it to remain secret. There were numerous uh, attacks that were on web, uh, and I got to live through all of them and <laughs> explain them all the way. And one of the ones that was uh, the, kind of like the nail in the coffin uh, was one that was written by at the bottom there, um, Scott Fleur, uh, Itzikman, and Adi Shamir. Scott Fleur was actually uh, working at Cisco as, long, uh, as well as I was, so I got to know um, uh, Scott. And he wrote a paper on the weaknesses in the key scheduling algorithm of RC4. And what he was able to show was that WEP was basically useless. The original standard had uh, another thing that's not, sometimes people will think of it as a security mechanism. It was, it's not really a security mechanism. And what you could do is you could not broadcast the SSIDs in the beacons. Um, I'm not going to say that it's not useful because it, sometimes it's kind of useful. For instance, if you have some SSID where there's a number of people walking around, you don't really want them to inadvertently connect. 
uh, and uh, that, that's kind of useful to kind of like hide it so that uh, you might be familiar with, like if you're a Windows user, um, if it's hidden, it, it's not going to show up under your uh, networks, wireless networks available to you. So therefore, if you kind of like just don't have it broadcasting, that's one way of kind of making it so that people don't connect up uh, if you didn't really want them to. Uh, and then if you have some, uh, your little brother and they want to get onto some uh, wireless network and you're busy with the PlayStation or something like that, and you want to keep them off, well, then you, you might do the hidden SSID. But it's not really a security mechanism. And that's kind of like the core point is that you should never really think of it as as such. I, and then uh, 802.11i came along and WPA and WPA2. Now, uh, kind of mentioned there is kind of laying the foundation, which you kind of think of as the top left. I would like to think of it that way. But over time, you know, there were some cracks there. Uh, the key thing, as we kind of mentioned, that there were these problems with WEP. And WEP was what it was actually used to encrypt the traffic. Uh, and that the first one that came along was CCMP. Uh, and it's, uh, the encryption is typically done by, the, at least assisted by uh, hardware. And definitely that's true of most of the uh, wireless that I'm aware of. Uh, and if that's when with C, uh, CCMP, uh, this implied that at the time of the standard coming out that you actually had to buy new hardware. Well, what are you gonna do with all those people that just bought some um, hardware uh, that re relied on web funding? Uh, TKIP was the answer there, that, that what that was intended to be was a temporary solution so that as people are using the equipment now, that it increased the uh, uh, the uh, level of security that was in place uh, until that they actually were going to go out and buy some new hardware. Uh, I kind of mentioned um, uh, Scott's name on the paper, uh, and he actually did help out when we were uh, coming up with uh, TKIP. And then how does WPA and WPA2 kind of fit in? Uh, WPA was, uh, before the 8 11 i was published, that was uh, centered around TKIP. Uh, and then WPA2 was with the new hardware. So that's why that there was this WPA and WPA2. How exactly does, that, uh, does it work? Uh, the APX, as you can think of it as like a proxy, uh, .1x has uh, the, the notion of a controlled port and an uncontrolled port. And what it actually kind of goes over that um, uncontrolled port is the .1x to uh, EAP traffic going over to typically a radius server. So if you're doing something like EAP TLS, uh, that EAP TLS traffic might, is inside of EAP, which would be inside of the .1x packet uh, over wireless. And then over the wire, it's going strictly to the radius server. Uh, until that, that point in which that the radius server kind of comes back and says, uh, we're all done. And if it's success, then he's also going to provide some keying material. Uh, and if it's not successful, um, they'll obviously not send the keying material and just say, nope, it's not going to, that they didn't pass success. Uh, so uh, that's the key thing there is that the access point is strictly just acting as a proxy. It's not actually doing the authentication unless that, that you've, physically had the radius server inside of it, then typically that's not. At the end of it, you now that the radius server has kind of provided that keying material over to the access point, there's a four-way handshake and that kind of then establishes that yes, that you, uh, from this four-way handshake, you're gonna go from what we call a PMK to your PTK and your GTK. And that's just to say that, okay, now that we've got this higher level of a keying material, we're now going to start establish what the actual keys that we're going to use for the encryption. And that gets done by the four-way handshake. Another thing that I wanted to talk to, not everybody is using a radius server, obviously. For instance, at home, you might not want to use a, um, a radius server. And even in small um, small offices, you, you might say, well, we're not going to set up a radius server. We're just going to have a pre-shared key. Uh, and so uh, where, what you end up doing is having uh, this uh, on the second bullet there, it says PSK equals, uh, I'll let you read that off. Uh, and that's actually defined if you actually look up the RFC 2898. And what that does is it says, okay, we're going to take a passphrase and then we're going to map that into uh, our, our king material that we're going to use for our four-way handshake. Uh, and so the thing that I want to note out there is that when you look at that, equation there. It says 4096. That's strictly a, a cycle count. Uh, and 
what this was is doing is that it's making it so that it makes you uh, more computational intensive to actually create the king material. Uh, so it makes it tougher for somebody, an, an attacker, to kind of like try to guess it. But it does not make it impossible. And so therefore, I want to kind of come back to that when we get into the WPA3 discussion. Uh, key caching was also introduced, uh, and this is the, the initial reason for bringing this in was if you were um, a client, like a laptop, and you're bouncing between two access points, uh, you're going to put a tremendous load onto the radius server. Um, that's kind of silly, right? Uh, you would say, well, if I'm coming back to the same access point that I was just at, it'd be nice if I just kind of said, hey, I'm coming back to you. I just want to use that same king material that I've got. And that's hence the name uh, key caching. Uh, same as time. And it also reduces load on the authentication server. This is also a very useful notion to keep in mind. Uh, EAP methods, uh, I thought that I, I should talk a little bit about this. Uh, last week, I didn't have this in there. And then I, after thinking about it, I, was like, well, I should probably talk about this a little bit. Uh, and that if you do pick up a, uh, an EAP method, so this is the actual authentication that takes place. Uh, the things that you want to keep in mind is that you want to make it so that there's mutual authentication, but both the server gets authenticated and the client gets authenticated. Uh, so uh, the other thing to keep in mind is when you're picking up these methods, that implies the type of credentials, the database that you have. So if you don't have a certificate database, uh, then you know, you're not going to be using something like EPTLS. Uh, so they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, and then there's a lot of other methods that came out as well. Uh, I kind of refer to them as the tunneled methods. Uh, for instance, PEEP, uh, EAP TTLS and TEEP. Uh, that, uh, for instance, PEEP and MS Chat V2 is very common. Now, what's done there is that you first authenticate the server. You can kind of think of this as, you know, uh, the analogy is doing banking. First, you authenticate that you're going to the right bank, to the right uh, website. After you've authenticated that, you build a tunnel. And therefore, now you could do some other um, authentication method to authenticate the client. And that authentication is protected by that tunnel that you've built up. Now I want to touch on 802.11r, which is for fast roaming. Uh, when this is kind of like the road runner going from one access point to another. And the key thing here is, is that uh, you might have some type of applications, for instance, voice where you say, hey, I can't go off and do a full authentication. If that full authentication is in like seconds range, then obviously if you're having a voice call, you know, do you want your voice call to all of a sudden have a break of like a couple seconds while you're doing this from? Obviously not. And so that's where 8 to 11 r comes into place. Uh, and the way that I kind of describe it here is that uh, 8 to 11 r does have a dependency on having something that is in between the access points in the radius server. Obviously, you know, if you're familiar with, uh, with wireless equipment, there's a, the notion of a wireless controller, it's very common. So then having that uh, wireless controller is a natural place to have, if you're looking at the 802.11R spec, you'll hear something about a key holder uh, and that, that the R0 key holder is where the radius NAS is located. And that's kind of where that you're, um, a wireless controller would be located. And then you'd also want to have a R1 key holder, and that's where the, the access point is located uh, typically. So now you've got this notion, all that, that, that is being done is, is that uh, when the original 8 to 11 i standard came out, you had a PMK and then going to a PTK. They just broke up that key hierarchy and put a middle layer in there so that you're able to say, okay, I definitely know that all these access points are within the domain that, uh, that I have. Uh, and so therefore that so you're able to kind of make it so that the, the roaming could go on quickly. Uh, that, now the authentication, the second authentication, after you've fully authenticated that first time, the key thing here is that second authentication does not involve the uh, radius server, so you have a little roam quickly. There are a couple of different types of uh, roaming methods. Uh, I'm not gonna get into this too much, other than just to mention that they kind of go off uh, quickly. Uh, they're, they're before the actual 802.1x uh, uh, exchange, so that's basically in your association process. The other thing you might have heard about was opportunistic key caching. Uh, this is not part of the 802.11i, but if you're familiar with key ca caching, 
then you can kind of like see if, oh, if you had a wireless controller uh, and it does have access to that keying material, it can kind of make that available to it. So it doesn't, I'll let you kind of like think about that and see, if, well, how does that, you know, it would naturally work. The other thing that kind of happens is that uh, you might have seen tools where people are trying to deauthenticate you. And that's definitely a problem that kind of came out. And uh, Aided to the Love and I did not address this directly, that they said, well, let's let some other work kind of happen a little bit later on. And this is basically to protect some of the management packets that are going on. For instance, things like the deauthentication packets. You want to, besides get, when you get that deauth packet, you want to know it's coming from the access point that you're actually uh, associated with. Uh, and so therefore, if it's a bad access point that kind of, kind of some attacker kind of sets up, uh, you want to make it so that, uh, that they're not able to kind of send you those DF. If they do send it to you, you're able to detect that that's not actually from you, from that bad device. Then that kind of takes us to WPA3. It's about time that the, the WPA2 uh, has been around. I kind of mentioned that was kind of like set up to uh, take care of uh, the, the new encryption that came along with CCMP. Uh, but there was a lot that was going on with A2.11, and there was uh, definitely that there were some cracks that were happening and they needed to be taken care of. And that's where WPA3 comes into a place. Uh, and this is just kind of uh, mentioning, well, there's a different uh, um, uh, uh, types of um, certification that could happen. Uh, there's the WPA3, and that is comprised of the WPA3 personal and enterprise. So this could be thought of as the, the pre-shared key or if you're doing the .1x type of authentication. And then there's also a couple of other um, uh, certifications. For instance, there's an enhanced open and then the easy connect. Uh, and then there's a link that if you really to to the Wi-Fi Alliance that kind of shows some of, those, uh, some of this. So what is WPA3 personal? Obviously, this was a replacement to uh, the pre-shared keys. When I was talking about uh, WPA and uh, I uh, to the 11i, I was talking about the pre-shared keys and that there was strictly all that ends up happening it, under WPA2 was that you say, oh, I've got this passphrase, I've got, I'm gonna enter in my keying material. What ends up happening to it is a bunch of math that kind of goes on, but that math that went on is very deterministic. So somebody could kind of go off and if the problem is, say for instance, somebody just did a packet capture of you connecting up via a pre-shared key, and then later on kind of said, well, I've got some guesses. They could pre-compute some of those guesses and then play through the math and then see if that those guesses, you know, if any of the guesses matched. Uh, it's kind of referred to as like a dictionary attack. Obviously that's a problem because uh, I, I think when the initial standard came out, we were kind of like thinking along the lines of, well, you know, at home you'd have a pre-shared key, but if you're in an office environment, then you'd be using some type of EAP method. That's not really the case that uh, there's a lot of places where people are using pre-shared keys, hence, you really need to uh, improve that the security that's going on, especially now that you know there's um, advances in computational power. And then, as far as WPA3 Enterprise, uh, the thing that I kind of mentioned here is that at the very bottom, I kind of make the note: uh, look for GCMP support besides legacy CCMP. Now, having said that, um, that uh, GCMP, there's a lot more that kind of goes along with it. For instance, when we're talking about the four-way handshake, uh, that's obviously if you've got larger keys, uh, then there's going to be some implications about some changes that have to happen there. If you're doing some type of EAP method, for instance, EPTLS, does that method provide enough keying material that you're going to need? So therefore, it, it's kind of, and then also when the key gets delivered from the radius server over to some other device, for instance, the access point. Uh, there, there might be some implications about changes that have to happen there. All of those things kind of get wrapped up in the WPA3 uh, enterprise, which is basically to allow uh, GCMP support and longer keys. <clears throat> uh, some of the other uh, certification programs, uh, the one that was kind of interesting, every so often you hear about it, was the enhanced open. And what is it actually is this? Um, you can kind of think, I think of it as in the coffee shop, you know, you get onto the, you get free Wi-Fi, uh, and that there's these captive portals and captive portals are not secure at all. Uh, it's kind of a way for the coffee shop 
to say, yes, you, you know, you need to make sure that you're connecting up, but to the actual user, that's where that some of the security problems are going to come in. Uh, and so it's a, an attempt to improve that. And I would say, yeah, it's definitely making, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, it's what, but it's an unauthenticated Diffie Hellman. Uh, and so what that means is that you could put just another access point uh, there. And if you, if you do connect up to that bad access point that's uh, from the initial connection, well, then it used, you know, it's not going to actually prevent that. What it does prevent is uh, if you were connected and the attacker it was kind of sitting there and he's trying to send you those DOF packets uh, that, that you've got some king material and that you're using that management frame protection. So therefore, he can't send you those DOF packets. Uh, so it's a step in the right direction, but maybe a little bit more work uh, that could be done there. Uh, easy connect. Um, now there are a couple of notes there. The one is, is that you could think of it as a, a replacement to the Wi-Fi protected setup, uh, that, but it's strictly defined within the Wi-Fi alliance. Uh, and so, um, how much is it actually used? It's kind of like used in in homes is pretty much what I've kind of seen. Uh, so I'm not going to touch on it too much beyond that. Then VLANs and VPNs. The things there is that what you'd end up seeing is that VLANs are very useful for uh, to restrict access. So you might say, hey, look, I've got some device and maybe it's something that strictly does voice, but the security is maybe just pre-shared key. And you're saying, well, I don't want that pre that device that only does pre-shared key to have access to my corporate network. Well, this is typically where you'd end up bringing in a VLAN so that therefore that device is able to do um, get onto a wireless network and you're able to restrict the type of access that it has. So therefore, it's, you're able to make a voice call, but you can't actually get onto the corporate resources beyond that. Another one that's very big would be like the guest SSID. So therefore, you're able to get, you say, hey, somebody shows up, they're not actually part of your corporation, but as a courtesy, you say, well, you can kind of get in onto the internet. Uh, what you're doing there is you're creating this SSID to VLAN mapping. So therefore, when they get on, that the authentication is pretty weak, uh, but they do get access to the internet and they're not onto the corporate network. Uh, likewise, VPNs, where, where can VPNs be used? Uh, well, sometimes organizations, what they'll do is they'll say, hey, we're only providing guest access. And if you wanted to get onto the corporate resources, you can kind of do wireless through that, um, that guest access and then do a VPN into the corporate network, just as if you're kind of like at home. Uh, WIDS, uh, just a quick touch on that. Uh, there's two types. You can kind of think of it as uh, non-malicious. That's the uh, somebody that says, you know what, um, I, I'm having problems. I, I can't get into the wireless network in this part of the, um, the office, and I'm not going to bug the IT guys because uh, they never listen to me anyhow. Uh, so I'm just going to bring some uh, home AP that I've got and put it onto the wireless network. That's a problem. Uh, so therefore, that you, you'll see functions such as rogue AP on the wire. So what that's doing is saying, I'm going to go off and not only know that that access point is there, but it's actually connected up to my corporate network. Uh, and therefore, that, that, that it's sort of a problem. Now, there's also the malicious type. Now, the malicious type is typically they're not in the office, but maybe they're in the parking lot. And so they're trying to set it up as a... Um, uh, bad access, uh, access points to get you know, devices that are people that are inside of the office to connect up to their bad access point and then steer the clients to that bad access point. Uh, so that's where WIDS kind of comes in. I know I went through a lot, and so I just wanted to take a breath here and then see if there were more questions that we wanted to discuss. All righty. Thank you, Dave. Well done, as usual. I'll see if we can dive into any of these questions, and I'll head off the common ones we get at the path here. Um, we always get asked for a copy of the slides and a copy of the recording. The, the answer is yes. We will uh, certainly share those with all of you who would like them. And I think uh, you all get an email from Todd anyway with uh, the recording uh, just as a just as, as an aside, but uh, if you have a need for these slides directly, we're happy to share those with you sooner rather than later. Um, let's see, here is the first question from Oliver. Why is LTE considered more secure than Wi-Fi? Uh, why? Uh, I would say that um, most of the IT professionals are familiar with Wireshark and can kind of do a 
uh, packet capture of it. Um, and if you want to do a packet capture of the LTE, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. All right. Um, next one here. Um, are there any special configurations for uh, 802.11r? Special considerations? Configurations. Configurations. Um, there's the... Um, I can't think of any off the top of my, my head, but I can kind of go back to that and take a look. Uh, there is sort of like the notion of, you know, how quickly that you roam. Uh, the king, the lifetime of the king material. So when you'd have to do a re-auth, that would be a configuration item. Uh, so if you're doing a phone call, you might say, oh, okay, I'm not, I, I don't want to send it down too low because somebody might be on the phone call for like 15 minutes or something like that. All right, that makes sense. Uh, rapid fire here. Next one. Um, what 802.11, uh, excuse me, 802.1x EAP methods do you re recommend? I definitely would recommend EAP TLS. Uh, and uh, that actually, uh, when we were getting started with, uh, since I was chair of 802.11i, I was also the software development manager over at uh, Cisco at the time that uh, this was coming out. Uh, there was only one method that was, uh, which was EAP TLS, uh, which was on an operating system that wasn't actually shipping for like six months. Uh, and so therefore there were some uh, different methods that were introduced to kind of like have a migration until some other uh, methods could kind of come out. Uh, now there are some implications to it, as I kind of mentioned before, is that, well, if you're doing EAP TLS, that means that you have to have a certificate um, a database. So you might, it's not just that your server has got a, a certificate on it, but that all of your clients then have to have a certificate on it. Uh, and so therefore that there is some more uh, overhead as to an IT uh, administrator that you have to take in, into account. That's where some of these tunneling methods help out and that you're able to say, you know what, the only certificate that I really need to concern myself with is to the radius server, uh, and therefore now I will, if I'm already authenticating via something like MS Chap, or there's numerous other methods, uh, like one-time passwords or something, that that could then end up being protected with inside of the tunnel. And so therefore you end up seeing that that the, uh, the for, for instance, the PEEP uh, with uh, MS Chap V2 uh, is very common as well. Uh, so I'd say that those two are very common um, and um, that you might find that there are likewise with anything, those have both been out for a while uh, and that there were some obviously some issues that are end up finding, for instance, <clears throat> that when you're doing something like PEEP with MS Chappy 2, the key material is not actually bound together. And if that's a concern, that's where uh, some of the other uh, tunneling protocols are kind of, for instance, TEEP kind of comes in mind. Uh, but, you know, how well widely deployed are there? Uh, so I'd say the two ones that you want to think about is, well, can you do EAP TLS? Uh, do you have that certificate uh, database uh, already deployed and you're easily able to kind of get, deploy that? If not, then you might consider something like uh, PEEP with MS Chat V2. All right. Well, thanks for these questions, folks. Keep them coming. We've got time for one, maybe two more, uh, depending on on uh, how long the responses are. Frank actually had a part two to his question. He's the one who asked the special configuration question for the 11R. Uh, the second part was 11W. Uh, 11W is that uh, that's the management frame protection. Likewise, that you might say, oh, it's uh, very similar to when you got your group uh, uh, keying material. You know, how quickly do you want to have to rekey that material? Uh, that's, uh, that, that might be something that you want to consider as well. All right. So um, question here from here from Chris. Um, will 7Signal have the ability to look into iOS device wireless statistics to be used for assist, uh, historical trends, investigation, and troubleshooting? Um, so uh, unfortunately not. Um, so and that's not just limited to us. Um, Apple locks down that that data uh, and uh, unfortunately does not let us run in the background um, of those iOS devices. So if you're talking specifically about uh, about um, mobile eye, I don't know if you want to answer that differently from a, a Sapphire eye perspective, but uh, if you're talking about mobile eye, Chris, no, unfortunately, 
uh, that's not even on our product roadmap for iOS because of the, the lockdown situation there. Yeah, uh, there there is the potential uh, that there is, uh, and we're always kind of looking at it from a perspective of like if you've got a MacBook or a <clears throat> Windows laptop. And yeah, he said it. specifically iOS, but I understand okay. what you're saying. Yep. Yeah, that you could kind of then end up uh, like, for instance, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is kind of keeping some of the historical information. For instance, we kind of bring out that there, there's the drivers and then it's useful then to kind of say, well, when exactly did that driver change? Because you wanted to end up seeing, well, what's the before and after? Uh, what does the wireless performance look like? And so that type of thing that, you know, we're kind of looking at um, and continuously other types of information as well. Um, but as you mentioned, yeah, yeah, if you do have like a phone, an iOS phone, then yeah, we're kind of locked down to what we can actually deliver. Yeah, so let me let me stop and clarify that a little bit uh, for those of you who I may just have confused. Um, there are two different different operating systems for Mac devices. One is uh, the Mac OS, that's what's on their laptops and uh, desktop computers, and then there's the iOS, which is what Chris is asking about. That's for the iPhone. So uh, Mobileye is not currently available for iPhone uh, for that lockdown reason. Um, our uh, customers who originally used that product uh, needed to launch uh, the application to uh, begin troubleshooting because Apple locks down the ability to uh, have run apps run in the background for troubleshooting. Um, so it just became, you know, not as useful because, um, you know, with the other products that are out there, Android, Windows, and, and Mac OS, we're running all the time. So you don't have to, you know, wait for an issue to begin uh, troubleshooting it. Um, so it just we just went away from it. Um, but we did, you know, we're, we're having ongoing conversations. The Apple guys were at our at our regional user group uh, last week at WLPC. So maybe it's something that um, uh, that's a future roadmap thing. But right now it's it's dead in the water. Uh, question, maybe the last one here, since we're right on time. Um, how will Wi-Fi 6 impact security elements? Good question. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned was I was talking about WPA3. And I was talking about GCMP, uh, and those are directly related to uh, Wi-Fi 6, because Wi-Fi 6 does say that you do need to uh, meet uh, WPA3. There's a number of reasons for it. Uh, one is <laughs> one of the security guys always like to think, yes, we won. We finally got it made it mandatory. Uh, GCMP is also useful for when you're um, uh, doing encryption uh, at higher speeds. Uh, so you don't, you know, obviously if you're, you don't want to see that your uh, throughput is at, uh, you know, close to a gigabit and then find out that when you turn encryption on that it's at a mega, megabit, you know, that would be a problem. Uh, now that's not that dramatic when you do in CCMP, but that uh, there are some impacts and GCMP is to um, uh, reduce that impact that goes on. All right, I think we're going to shut it down there. So quick plug for our product tour. Um, before you all go, go.7signal.com forward slash tour. No sales pitches, uh, just pure product tour uh, demonstration. That's with me and uh, um, Eric Camuli on uh, every Friday at noon. So feel free to join us there. You can register at that link. Don't forget the go dot, and then I'll get you to the right place. Uh, everyone, thanks you, thank you for coming today. Dave, great job. Thanks for answering questions and presenting to us today. Uh, everyone, we'll see you next week. Thanks for coming.